Sean, can you hear me? I can hear you. Good. So I have to start with uh, in immediate mea culpa. Um, we've been chatting away for the last 10 minutes or so, uh, happily doing our introductions, uh, just like we did when we tested this. And I've had one eye on the YouTube, uh, and it's it's been saying excellent connection and streaming video, but uh, I didn't press the right button to actually kick the feed off. So this is why we this is why we said that this was a um, an initial session. So here we are. The good thing is we now got a little bit of extra practice time in, so that's good. Um, so so with that said, I think what we'll do is we'll still wrap inside the initial time window that we set. And apologies to those uh, people who are watching this and wondering why they had to wait ten minutes before it started. Um, I'm confident we'll be better next week, uh, but this is just the nature of it. I think when you when you do these things. Um, so with that all said. Um, before we do anything else, I suppose we should introduce ourselves. Um, my name's Chris. I'm a developer advocate at Tigera. I'm Chris Tompkins. Uh, so my job is to um, champion uh, champion user needs, basically, to support um, Project Calico users and um, contributors. Um, so that involves, uh, you know, um, blog posts and webinars and sessions like this, and also interacting with users on our Calico user Slack channel, so we should say that while we remember. Um, anything that we cover off today, uh, Sean and I are both uh, active on our Calico user Slack channel, so if you'd like to join us on there, if you go to the Project Calico community page, it will tell you how to how to go about doing that. Um, so I've worked in networking since 2000, and I used to do kind of traditional Cisco Juniper um, single device CLI, and got frustrated with the lack of scalability of that kind of solution. So I got interested in kind of large scale automation and uh, took an interest in infrastructure as code and how you could automate a large number of devices in a predictable and, and excellent way. So that got me to dealing with Calico and that's how I got chatting to you and joined the team. Um, did, so I'll let you do your introduction. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, hopefully I'm not muted. There we go. You are not. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I'm Sean Crampton. Uh, I'm a, a distinguished engineer at Tigera. Um, I look after our data plane and our per host agent, um, which is uh, called Felix. That's our um, control plane for, for Calico. Installs your policy, um, sets up uh, the, the routing for pods, that kind of stuff. Um, and I also um, look after our an out proxy, which is called Typha, if you've if you've heard of that, um, and uh, I jumped the gun and said control plane, which is something Chris is about to talk about. Yeah, about. yeah, we will in a sec. But before we do, we just quickly talk about what Calico Live is and why we're kind of here. Um, so it's exciting to have you um, here because uh, we're uh, Calico Live is an, is an occasional informal um, live video stream series. So the idea is. We have lots of other ways to learn about Calico documentation and so on, um, but we wanted to have kind of quite an informal, relaxed way for um, people to uh, to hear from you know people really, really close to this software, um, of, of which you are a perfect example, um, who have a great deal of, of, of knowledge and, and are happy to take a short amount of time to share it. Um, so I'm really, really thankful for you doing that. Um, and we're starting off focusing on uh, the eBPF data plane for Calico, um, sharing kind of more than what you get in the documentation. So kind of interesting real world stories, uh, technical deep dives um, and, and, that, and that kind of stuff. And also uh, ask, asking and answering questions that, you know, the kind of questions that you might have always wondered but not known how to ask or, or who to ask. Um, we will generally publish an agenda before each event um, as we did today. Um, today's agenda, we're gonna, we're gonna I would say end up skipping the last point or two, probably because of because of starting late due to my blunder. Um, but we will take uh, we've, we've you know we've got enough content to see us through, and if people have um, questions, we we're quite excited to be derailed. This is a kind of session where being derailed is fine. Um, so if people have ideas or questions, uh, I've got one eye on the on the YouTube chat, and we'll either take them online or take them offline if they're too uh, complex or if we need further research before we can answer. Um, so yeah, with all that said, um, we're, we're talking about eBPF and data planes and um, we will kind of need to drill into why why we're even here. So that the first kind of talking point we had is why are we here talking about eBPF and data planes? And um, 
Calico supports multiple data planes and I wanted to just briefly talk about why that is and how eBPF fits into that and then we'll kind of get into more of a deep dive on, on eBPF. So, like I said, I've been doing um, traditional networking since 2000 and I remember the, the old days where um, net, your network being up wasn't quite as critical as it is nowadays and devices from vendors back then um, were monolithic software, uh, monolithic software architectures. <coughs> so if we use Cisco in ex as an example, but this is obviously in no way uh, isolated to them, they had a, a monolithic piece of software called Cisco IOS, which is the software that runs on, that ran back then on their, their routers. And it was fine and stable until it wasn't. And that was fine back in the day. Uh, but that was because the software was either, was a large blob of software that either was functioning or wasn't. Um, they, as, as kind of people ex, people's expectations changed, they moved to having a, a monolithic version of that called iOS XE, which ran on Linux, and then a fully proper modular version called iOS XR. And um, we, I did this other session that, that goes into this in a lot more detail, but there, there was a session I did called The Importance of Modularity and Multiple Data Planes at the Kubernetes Security and Observability Summit um, a few weeks. Was that weeks or months? A few weeks ago, I'd say. Uh, it feels, feels like a long time ago already, but, um, but the crux of it is that you can make your software, your networking software a lot more um, scalable uh, or, and reliable by having a con two, two software components, a control plane and a data plane. The uh, control plane's job, uh, both of these constructs exist in the same physical device, um, well, usually. Um, and the control plane's job is to do the kind of high level uh, architecture stuff like um, maintaining a view of the topology of the whole network um, and running uh, management connections to the device um, and those kind of bits of software are kind of necessarily complex. And so they have data structures that are, are of varying sizes and their compute requirements vary heavily depending on what the workload specifically is. And so those run on usually on an x86 or ARM CPU. And that by separating that functionality out, you can, you can put the right kind of workload onto the right kind of tin to run it. And then you run this other piece of software called the data plane, and its job is different. Its job is to actually forward the content that you're sending out. So, so sorry, that users are sending across the, the device. So for example, the actual cat videos or the emails uh, or whatever it is that, that's being sent across, um, across that network device, that traverses the data plane. And in an, in an ideal uh, scenario, the, the control plane is, is not getting involved in that traffic any more than it absolutely has to. So it might make an initial forwarding decision depending on the architecture or in some architectures it might make, it might never touch the traffic at all. And, and the data plane is kind of like a minimal and lean implementation of the code that's strictly necessary for the actual forwarding features that you want to support on the device. Um, when we practice this, I remember you making one other point which I really liked, which is that the two can, if things are built in the right way, the two can be briefly separated from each other. So it's possible for the data plane in the right architecture, it's possible for a data plane to carry on making forwarding decisions without yeah. the control plane. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to cover off on that kind of high level view before we dig in a bit? Yeah, I, um, I think that's exactly right. So um, uh, the we we split the control plane and the data plane. Um, so the, as you say, control plane makes decisions um, control plane is kind of architected in quite a different way from the data plane. So when you're building a data plane, it has to be extremely reliable, has to be kind of bulletproof. And, and we do that um, uh, in a in a couple of ways. I mean, making it as minimal as possible, um, uh, making it you know heavily reviewed, heavily tested, all that kind of stuff, um, relying on the work of that's already been done to make reliable data planes. So uh, the Linux kernel, for example, is is battle hardened um, and, and, you know, it's packet parsing and forwarding logic and all that sort of stuff is is battle hardened and well tested. Um, so if you use those in your in your data plane, you're taking advantage of that. 
and then the control plane it gets this benefit by um, being kind of detached in that it doesn't need to be quite as reliable it can restart to load its config it can um, you know if if it does need to be upgraded it can be upgraded um, without stopping packets from flowing because the packets don't go through the control plane so it, it makes a lot of things simpler by having um, having a sort of control plane where the brain lives and a data plane where the packets are flowing and then the the, the data plane is where you have to worry about being able to swap out code on the fly while packets are flowing through it and, and nasty things like that that are, that are hard. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And the other thing I suppose that we, that, we, that we alluded to but didn't say is while the control plane needs to run on, uh, on a kind of more traditional you know, CPU, um, the data plane, because it's small and predictable in its size um, and minimal, it runs on, on an ASIC implementation or on whatever hardware acceleration features the, the platform offers. Um, which, which is a benefit of the size. That's true, true in a router, but um, I guess the analogy from our point of view is that um, you know our control plane runs as a user space process, whereas the the data plane runs in kernel kernel space, where it's it's more minimal, it's more limited, it's it's more um, uh, like hardened, um, but uh, it may or may not be running in in hardware like it well actually a... that's a cool that's, that's actually a great analogy though because really you know you think what what is the difference between an asic and a cpu or well, you know it, that it's the number of features that the asic offers and the and the amount by by um by limit by massively limiting the the available instruction types and so on and by massively limiting the kind of um, data structures that it that it can handle then then they can get this massive performance boost and i guess so it's not really that different to the difference between a kernel, a kernel and user space, you know, a kernel is a much more kind of defined, functionally defined um, component of the software yeah. architecture. So yeah, that I makes sense. Everything's a sliding scale these days. I think it's it's always, you know, is it is it higher up in the stack or is it lower down in the stack? And is it more, more kind of battle hardened and like must be bulletproof or is it more kind of, Microservice must be restartable, must be easy to develop. That kind of that yeah. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and on that point, um, that's the other and another good side of, of separating the two out. You get this kind of the control plane software that you guys work really hard to write um, doesn't need to change very much when we change the data plane, um, meaning that uh, you kind of get the benefits of not changing it. So you get the stability and the um, the organizational agility of not having to rewrite that code and it's more easy to audit and more easy to reuse. And similarly, the data plane is also more easy to audit because the functionality that, that lives in there is 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 smaller and more predictable. Um, so I could I could move on to the analogy we had about IPv4 and MPLS. In fact, I probably should, given that we're a little bit behind, thanks to my um, my blunder, <laughs> which I'm going to keep referring to now and, until it wakes me in, in my sleep. Um, so what I can do, I believe, is share this browser window. There you go. Yeah. So you should be seeing. Um, so the analogy I like is about um, uh, Calico supports multiple data planes, and it, and and it does that because one data plane is not. The right fit for every workload. Um, so well, we had that talk. There's a, there's a, there's a talk about that um, as well. Um, several talks about that. But um, for example, we have the, the VPP data plane, which uh, has a great performance and incredible um, IP, uh, IPsec performance. But supporting multiple data planes allows you to to have the right tool for the job and. The, the, the analogy I wanted to draw was between IPv4 and MPLS because you know I've come from uh, you know a traditional network engineering background. Um, I found this interesting when I when I first learned about it. So we're looking at the IPv4 packet header, and um, it's kind of uh, the the really key bits that you that you usually see are, are in the first twenty bits, uh, twenty bytes, excuse me. But it doesn't actually have to be um, twenty bytes. It can actually be uh, slightly larger, and uh, inside that header, you have lots of complexity. So you have uh, a header checksum that has to be rewritten every time the um, the uh, header is recalculated, and the header uh, contains um, a TTL 
uh, which obviously every time the CTL is written, so then the chipcom has to be rewritten. Um, and in terms of the actual lookup of IP for, IPv4, in terms of, of, of the routing, um, every hop, the destination address has to be compare, compared to the routing table of the device. And anyone who's dealt with subnet masks knows that which part of the IP address designates the host and which part designates the network actually can be moved. And that was um, one of the great strengths of IPv4 when it first appeared was the fact that it had this concept of a variable, variable length subnet mask. But even as you know, a relatively amateur programmer, when I think about the implementation of that, it's obvious that there's quite a lot of complexity in the idea of be being able to compare um, a, a destination address against a routing table of multiple mask lengths. Um, did you want to chip in on that at all? Because obviously you you're a, um, you do more programming than I do. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so this is where your kind of your ASIC might come in as well. So um, uh, what you're trying to do with a with an IP address is a usually a longest prefix match. Yes. So you're looking for the kind of longest um, subnet that matches your your IP address, um, and that's that's not something you can do super efficiently in a normal um, a normal CPU. You have to do kind of a tree structure and walk along the tree structure, and it's multiple steps. Um, whereas if you're doing it in an ASIC, um, you can dedicate some hardware directly to kind of doing a massive parallel comparison of, of all the different possible lengths, and then it spits out the right answer. But that's very expensive hardware to, to scale up to you know, the size of the internet routing yeah, table. Yeah, exactly. And then, and, then, and then when you see the price tag of kind of modern modern switches and routers, you understand why, start to understand why that is the case. Um, so, and then in, in, contra in contrast to that, before I move away from this diagram, um, I should probably say it's Creative Commons licensed and, and um, thank you very much. Uh, I think it's I think it's Michelle Bagney in the corner there who, who I should be thanking. But, um, but uh, if I flip over and contrast MPLS and how that works, um, the MPLS header is a much simpler affair. Um, it's fixed length, um, and you can see that there's a, an initial label, which is always 20 bits. Um, there's an EXP um, component, which is three bits, um, which is for used, usually used for class of service, um, but it's only three bits. And then there's a, a stack label, which is either a zero or one, it's a single uh, bit, and the time to live. And there's the forwarding decision is uh, to look at the next label hop, um, and it's just a table lookup. Uh, so there's no variable length mask, there's no longer a prefix match, none of that complexity that you talked about. Um, and you just, uh, to make a hop, you look up your next label um, in a lookup table, you um, decrement the TTL, and and that's it. And there's no, uh, there's no a checksum to update or anything like that and I think when we talked about this offline you made the really valid point that that therefore there has to be some other complexity in the control plane to make sure that the label forwarding uh, uh, data structure is actually there on every on every um, device but the, but the point I was trying to make is that in the data plane there's so much less complexity necessary and that's why MPLS is, is dominant in in uh, in service provider uh, ISP networks because it, it it's cheap to implement the forwarding decisions on the LAN devices. And so it's kind of neither of these are, is a bad protocol. Obviously, they're both incredibly successful, but they both suit a particular use case. And and yeah, so it's you know kind of not one tool to fit all jobs. Um, does that does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know that um, MPLS, because um, it has that little bit of flexibility of exactly how you use the labels, um, they've been able to develop all kinds of um, complicated um, uh, features on top of it. So the hardware remains very simple. All it knows how to do is look up an MPLS label and forward. Um, but then you can add kind of features on top like um, fast reroute and things like that, where you've pre-calculated what to do if this link goes down, what to do if that link goes down, 
what to do if this link goes down while that one is coming up and you have all these things pre-calculated mm, yeah. and then uh, if the hardware detects that link has gone down it can automatically switch to the other MPLS routing table and send the packet that way and, and it's all very efficient. Yeah, yeah, it's incredible when it works. In fact, I can remember testing a few MPLS networks that I built for customers kind of when they were still greenfield and kind of sometimes not being convinced that it had failed over because it was so seamless, you know, it's it's when it works, it's magical. So yeah, it's kind of, you know, it's the right tool for the right job. And um, the EPPF data plane is an amazing um, data plane for us. Um, and it does have really cool functionality, which again, um, we won't drill into this too much because we've done it in other talks, but um, if people don't know what those advantages are, there are several recent talks that uh, you can find linked from um, our YouTube and from uh, our community uh, site and from um, from our blog. But for example, um, there was a turbo turbocharging AKS networking with EBPF post we did, but broadly, the EBPF data plane gives you great performance, um, source IP preservation, which is an amazingly useful feature, um, direct server return, and it pulls out the kube proxy functionality and, and takes away the need to for kube proxy to exist in the cluster. Um, but as with anything, um, the disadvantages that I, that I kind of, that pop into my head are interoperability, um, which I think you can probably say more about than I can. Um, I don't know if you want to do that. Uh, yeah. Um, so I, I guess I um, haven't sort of talked too much about how how the EBPF data plane works and how it's different from, from what else we have. Um, but if you compare it to the standard Linux data plane, the, the IP tables based data plane, um, the IP tables based data plane uses the kind of existing hooks in the Linux kernel to um, to do the various things that those hooks are intended to do. So there's a there's an IP tables table for filtering traffic, which we use for policy. There's one for NAT, which Cube Proxy uses for um, NATing traffic, i.e. implementing your service routing and that sort of stuff. Um, and there's one for SNAP, which we use to implement um, uh, like NAT as packets leave the cluster, so so that the uh, the source IP is masqueraded, that that kind of thing. Um, and because all of those features are kind of um, baked into the kernel already, um, Cube Proxy can manage its NAT table, and we can manage our filter table, and the two just kind of um, uh, work together. But when we when we developed the eBPF data plane, um, due to some of the ways that that Calico does things specifically, um, we found that we couldn't easily interrupt with what Cube Proxy was doing in IP tables. So we ended up needing to bring that functionality in house. But that that was actually quite a sort of fortuitous thing anyway, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of the nice features of the eBPF data plane. Um, yeah, apart from performance, like the sort of quality of life features, like um, uh, like uh, source IP preservation um, that you mentioned, uh, those really come from the Cube Proxy implementation being different to um, to what uh, what Cube Proxy can do. So it's kind of uh, the way I think about the about eBPF in general is um, it opens up this whole kind of um, ability to experiment and do different things that the kernel didn't have baked in before. Um, and that has allowed us to do source IP preservation. Um, if you contrast that to, to trying to get a feature like that into the kernel um, natively, um, I mean, it would be an uphill battle for starters. You'd need to learn how to contribute to the kernel. You'd need to learn the right language, C for the kernel. You need to um, submit series of patches if you succeed, then the best you can hope for is that it ends up in the next release of the kernel, which will flow through to your users kind of two or three years down the line, and then you can start using it in your product. Um, with eBPF already being baked into the kernels that are available, it allows for this new level of experimentation and kind of building interesting features that that weren't baked in. And that's, that's really kind of 
uh, interesting. Yeah, that that's fantastic. So yeah, that that ties in really nicely because we were just running off, uh, you know, a list of what the, kind of the disadvantages, and and that is to say, you do need a recent kernel to to be able to get those that you know the functionality, um, but to be able to run the code in the kernel. But it's a great idea to be able to run, you know, to be able to run code in the kernel without um, without having to contribute it in that in the kind of traditional way. Um, so all right, so when we were talking about what. Um, what we might talk about that wasn't just uh, you know the same content we've covered off in other um, posts. We had this idea of um, some background and context, and, and kind of trying to help people understand where um, where eBPF fits and where our code fits in the flow um, in, in relation to uh, NetFilter and XDP and all the other concepts. Um, did you want to share your screen and tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I, yeah, I can do that. Cool, um, great. So yeah, I'm sharing. Uh, let me switch over. Um, okay, yeah, I think we. Uh, I'm just going to switch you to the other one. Actually, other. Uh, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, no offense, but I've put you behind the content. <laughs> I decided the content was slightly slightly more important. So no offense. Um, yeah, yeah. So go for it. We can see that. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's yeah, that's better. I'll see if I could zoom in one more notch. Yeah. Um, so I, I've grabbed the um, the diagram of the Linux kernels uh, networking stack from Wikipedia, the, the NetFilter uh, diagram. So credit to the, uh, the authors there. Um, I don't have the uh, the byline on, on screen. I'll see if I can dig that out at the end. Um, maybe if I just kind of zoom in on a, a section of it. Um, so I, I kind of alluded to this before, but the the kernel is kind of structured into all these different modules. Um, and um, there's various different types of types of block in this diagram. Like I know I know it's a little bit of an eye chart and, and it's probably uh, hard to read on, on the um, stream. Um, but I, I wouldn't worry about sort of understanding every little detail. Um, but the basic idea is this diagram shows the process that a, a packet goes through when it enters the kernel. So it enters on the left hand side in this this balloon um, labeled start and it, it progresses over to the right. Um, and we're interested in rooted packets because Calico is a rooted data plane. So it will come through these various gray boxes which are, I'll ignore for the minute and then it goes up into this green layer and you can ignore the blue layer at the bottom because we don't we don't use that. Yeah and just to just to draw the analogy for for kind of uh, no kind of more traditional network engineers, obviously link layer being layer two, so that's that's your um, your switching layer, and uh, layer three is where the routing happens, which is why we care about the green component. Yeah, exactly. Um, so if you think about the, um, like Calico's um, standard Linux data plane, so the, the IP tables data plane, um, we wouldn't have anything attached in these gray boxes over here. They're kind of more to do with BPF when we come to talk about that in a minute. Um, but the packet would come into this uh, this kind of chain of boxes in the in the middle green section, and each of these boxes is a um, a net filter hook. So net filter is the kernel's um, underlying architecture for um, like filtering and manipulating packets, um, and that's been under heavy development for. A, for a long time and has gone through multiple different generations of, of API on top of it. Um, so the, the current one is NF tables. Um, the one before that was IP tables. I think before that they had IP chains, um, but it's kind of built built on the similar sort of underlying technology with a lot of a lot of uh, churn on the on the top of it. So basically the packet comes into the kernel and at various points you can add uh, you have these hooks where you can do specific things with the packet. So yeah. comes in on the left, and uh, the first hook is called the raw pre-routing hook, and that hook um, gets past the packet, and it can um, it it sees the packet before the routing decision has been made. So before we know where this packet is going, it sees the packet before connection tracking has been activated. So it's very, very early in the processing. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, moving forward a little bit, you'd then have connection tracking, which would look up a packet and assign it to a flow. 
that's very important for Calico because we have a flow-based firewall. So if a packet is allowed on the egress from a pod, we want the return packets that are part of the same flow to be automatically allowed, that kind of thing. Yeah, so, so that's connect- what, what's up. Often called as, yeah, often called stateful firewalls. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then you get into some sort of special purpose chains. Then the NAT pre-routing chain. That's where that's where Cube Proxy puts its rules to do service NAT when um, when it's in IP tables mode. So Cube Proxy would have rules in there that say if the destination IP is 10.96.0.1, then rewrite the destination IP to be the API server's address, or if it, you know, your cluster IP or your node port port, then rewrite the destination to be a particular backing pod. Um, so that's where that would happen. Um, then after that, the packet gets routed. So that that's the decision about how the packet is going to be forwarded um, on from, from that point. Um, and for example, if, uh, if it was going to a local pod, it would be routed to the VETH interface of that local pod. Um, and and that decision is recorded on the packet buffer as it goes through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're typically dealing with forwarded traffic. So we follow this line off to the right. Um, and then we get to the mangle forward chain, which is kind of very special purpose. Then we get to the filter forward chain. And that's where Calico policy typically lives for, for workloads. So by the time it reaches that chain, um, the kernel has already denatted the packet for services. So the, that chain sees the um, uh, the kind of the real pod IP, mm-hmm. um, and then the policy can act on the real pod IP and the source IP and and so on. So is it fair to say that given we're, given what we're describing at the moment is is the IP tables data plane? Is it fair to say that? really the complexity or the performance, a lot of the performance increase for the eBPF data plane comes from having not having to jump through these this, you know, this chain of steps. Yes, I, I think so. Um, so the the nice thing about this approach is that it's fairly well thought out. Everything kind of everything has its place and there's a place to do most things you would want to do with the packet. Mm -hmm. So if you want to drop a packet before it hits the flow, the the contract, you know, flow assignment, you can do that in the raw pre-routing table. If you want to see the packet before it's been natted, you can do that in the mangle pre-routing table. If you want to see it afterwards, you've got the filter table Mm -hmm. um, and so on. It's, It's all kind of, built so all these different features kind of generally work together Um, but the downside is um, the packet goes through all these different stages even if they're not necessarily needed for Mm -hmm. your particular application Um, yeah so it's exactly what we i think we even said earlier on it's it's that compromise isn't it between um you know between offering a a large set of, of, of features versus a minimal set of features and, 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 and the performance increase that you can get by cutting out those features. Yeah, uh, and particularly um, if you're using NF tables, which is the latest generation of, of this filtering framework, hmm. um, then they've gone for a, a sort of quite a modular approach to the API so that you can swap in tiny little bits into the filter forward hook Right and 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 you know add and remove individual rules at once and that means that um, they've had to kind of leave the data structures in the kernel fairly unpacked rather than sort of uh, compiling them down to bytecode which is what IP tables used to do I think yeah and that ends up being a little bit less efficient I think they're going to improve that over time but you saw a, a dip in performance there because they'd gone more modular and more kind of fine-grained and how how all the apis work mm-hmm. yeah um all right so then so then um where does where does um bpf sit in this diagram and how does that relate yeah um so going back to the the stuff on the left um uh bpf also has i mean i, I mentioned hooks so hooks are kind of points in the kernel where you can attach some code or some um, like some IP tables logic or something like that. Um, 
BPF works on the principle of having hooks in the kernel as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are various hooks in the kernel that you can attach BPF programs to. And then the BPF programs, um, they run when something happens associated with that hook. Um, so let's give an example. This first hook here um, is on this diagram um, uh, rather uh, nicely. So the packet enters on the left. Um, and the very first thing that happens to the packet is it arrives in some kind of memory buffer in the network card. And then immediately there's a BPF hook that runs inside the network driver in the kernel mm -hmm. before almost anything happens in the kernel. So before the main generic logic of the kernel kicks in, this hook runs and it gets, um, you can attach a, a program to that hook. It's called the XDP hook. So you can attach a BPF program to the XDP hook it sees the packet very, very early, and it can do things like drop the packet, send it back out of the same interface, mm -hmm. having you know done a, a Mac switch or something. Um, or it can send the packet up to user space using uh, this XDP redirect hook, so that for this XDP redirect um, function. Oh, OK, yeah. Um, so that's, that's being used by things like um, the VPP um, uh, like that's one of the options for getting packets into VPP mm -hmm. is to use a small XDP program that captures the packet and sends it up to the VPP data plane, which right. runs in user space. Right. And then the rest of the kernel doesn't see the packet because it's been kind of pulled out and sent up to user space for so does that, you know, ho does hopefully that, very fast processing up there. Does that first hook that we're talking about now, is, um, does that fit into the functional or versus probe um, uh, component of is it a fun is it it sounds like a functional hook is that right so so yeah so um we had a little discussion before about kind of classifying the bpf mm, hooks right and and i i sort of bucket them into a, a couple of different buckets so um one is like functional hooks mm. um xdp is definitely a functional hook it has lots of capabilities for what it what it can do so it's um it's specifically about packet processing and it has a bunch of um, like helpers that are available within its little sandbox yes. that allow it to do special things with packets. So redirecting them to user space is a sort of packet level operation, mm -hmm. um, and and you need to be in the XDP hook to to do that. And so which 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 functionality you have depends on which hooks the kernel offers you, uh, which sorry which helpers the kernel offers you at that particular hook, right? Yeah, okay. exactly. So, gotcha. so XDP has a certain group of things that it can do with the packet. Um, and then um, the the other kind of bucket of, of hooks, uh, uh, more things like um, uh, K probes and things like that, where uh, the, there are millions of K probe hooks inside the kernel where you can attach um, you can attach probes to see what is this little tiny bit of the kernel doing. Mm -hmm. But in general, those are sort of read only and they can't do anything interesting. Mm -hmm. um, or well, they can do very interesting things, but very interesting sort of read only, only things. things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so you could, you could attach a K probe program to uh, one of the functions in the kernel that is processing a packet. Um, but that would allow you to collect statistics about what what is going on with that function, but it wouldn't allow you to redirect the packet up to user space because that K probe is kind of in a little sandbox and it, it's allowed to kind of poke at the data it can see and have a look at it, but it can't it can't just implement arbitrary function mm. that you want to slip into that bit of the kernel. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so yeah, BPF is all about sandboxing, like like the technology is all about sandboxing these little hooks so that you can install a, a, a BPF program and it can run safely in a little sandbox inside the kernel um, and be triggered when, when certain things happen. Um, so the XDP hook, um, Calico's made use of that for a very long time. Um, so we had a, an XDP sort of um, uh, like a, a pre-filter that we could use to implement um, a subset of our host endpoint policy. 
and that was useful for dropping like packet floods if you if you had a particular group of ips that were spamming you with lots of packets yeah right makes perfect sense you could put in a rule and we would render that into xdp um if as assuming the rule was of a format that that the xdp hook could handle we put it in xdp and we block that traffic really early on and presumably and even, because no buffers been no buffers been um set up for the traffic then so so yeah. that makes it much more effective for that kind of ddos mitigation kind of scenario or, or, or at least dos mitigation yeah, scenario exactly so we we saw a kind of order of magnitude improvement on the the number of packets we could drop by doing that you know sort of de it, it depends a lot on the hardware and it depends on how offloaded your XDP program is. Mm -hmm. But even if you just have a, an XDP program that runs in the driver hook, the driver layer, then um, it it was still giving, you know, two times or better kind of performance for that. Yeah, case. I actually remember finding an interesting when I first came on into Tiger and I was kind of just absorbing anything I could find. Well, I still am really, but I remember finding a blog post you wrote about that. Or, uh, I believe you did. I think it was you. Um, but that was very interesting. So we're very nearly out of time already because we had a late start. Um, and time flies anyway when you're having fun. So, um, but yep. the but um, I suppose where we could probably wrap up or it might be just to just to say where the so we've said already that Calico has code hanging off that uh, uh, that hook. But the majority of our code in our EPPF data plane is hanging off the ingress and egress QDisc hooks. Is that right? That's, that's right. So. Um... We actually hook in a little bit later for the um, for the bulk of our eBPF data plane. Um, so the XDP hook runs very early, but it doesn't have quite as much capability as the ingress QDisc hook, which comes a little bit later. Um, and we can do things in that, like um, implement um, like. Uh, tunneling of traffic, which we use for doing um, source IP preservation a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. We can also hook into um, routing. So routing is quite complicated and your your host might have complicated routing rules that Calico had not, no part in setting up. Mm -hmm. um, and at the by the time we get to that point, it's easier to do routing lookups. It, in the kernel's routing table mm -hmm. so that we get the right answer rather than trying to kind of duplicate that function. Um, and then a big part of what we do is um, if we, we try to implement a fast path where if we spot that a packet has come in on one interface and it's going out of another Calico controlled interface, we skip all of that kernel processing in the middle. So the ingress QDisc happens quite early on and then it can redirect the packet out into the egress queue disk, uh, like directly, and skip all of those kind of IP tables, net filter steps in the middle. Yeah, that makes perfect um, sense. One thing I'm quite excited that I think we'll talk about definitely in a later session, um, later one of these sessions is, um, of course, that the, the the more you accelerate something, sometimes that it can become trickier to get good visibility of what's actually happening and where um and we we you and I are working on multiple fronts about that right now about how we uh um you know blog posts and webinars and so on about about this but I'd like to talk about that in one of the later sessions as well about uh how how we can do that um we're out of time already and I'm conscious that you have other meetings um so uh, it was a slightly shorter one than I intended, um, but but uh, but hopefully that was enjoyable for people. And um, if anyone, so we didn't get any questions. Uh, we did have quite a few people were watching, um, but we didn't get any questions. So if anyone had questions and just didn't want to ask them because they didn't feel you know they could or whatever, um, just remember that Sean and I are active in our Calico user Slack, and we you know we're very happy to get involved in those conversations. Um, so yeah, I guess it just remains to say thanks. Uh, thanks, Sean, very much for taking your time out of your calendar yeah, to do this. Uh, thanks, no worries. Yeah, yeah, and I'll see you next time, yeah? Yeah. Take care. Bye.